Uh, well, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C. For those of you joining us online uh, or for the first time, uh, we are a nonpartisan think tank promoting U.S. Global, global leadership and engagement for a secure, free, and prosperous future. My name is Nate Sibley, and I run a Hudson project called the Kleptocracy Initiative, uh, conducting policy research to counter corruption from authoritarian regimes. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Andrew Adams, uh, director of Task Force Klepto Capture, the interagency unit set up in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year to investigate and prosecute Russian sanctions evasion. Andrew's a distinguished prosecutor who joined the US Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York in 2013 and went on to lead high profile cases against Russian money laundering and organized crime. And it was this experience that led to his being appointed director of Task Force Klepto Capture back in March 2022. Uh, since then, Andrew's team and their international partners have worked tire tirelessly uh, to deprive Kremlin-linked elites and of their ill-gotten gains, uh, often making headlines with the seizure of super yachts and other luxury assets. Uh, here at Hudson, we've been sort of laser-focused on the Russian kleptocracy issue since 2014. We were one of the first, if not the first, think tank to have a dedicated program to it. And I can tell you, I was never, never, you know, 1% one, uh, 1 of bus as busy as I was uh, from March last year onwards. So it's amazing to see this issue kind of come to the fore of of US foreign policy in this way. Uh, today, Andrew's going to tell us uh, in more detail about what this work really involves uh, and what new developments we can expect from Task Force Klepto Capture in the weeks and months ahead. He'll now provide some opening remarks, uh, following which we'll proceed to a discussion and audience uh, Q&A. So, Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, everybody. So let me wait, just start very quickly. Um, by uh, mentioning a quick anecdote. Uh, about five years ago, uh, I was a, a still relatively mid-level prosecutor at the um, uh, US Attorney's Office and sort of at the point where you think about where you want to specialize and what you, you want to do. And I saw a speech by a Spanish prosecutor named uh, Grinda Gonzalez. Um, who talked about Russian organized crime. He talked about it as uh, a form of civilizational assault, I think was the, the phrase that he used. He talked about its corrosive effects on democracy and democratic institutions. And it was really um, an, an inspiring talk that he gave on, on that day um, and steered me in this, in this direction uh, and remains sort of a foundational text for, for me and for this task force. And I mention it today because it happened at the Hudson Institute about five years ago, maybe in this room. Um, and so it's a, a special honor to be invited to speak here today. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's normal to have an emotional attachment to a think tank, um, but I do have one uh, that I want to uh, just share with the room before we kick off. Um, so I'd like to, to spend a few minutes at the outset talking about the work that this task force has undertaken in the last year, uh, approximately the last year, some successes, some hurdles, and some strategies for jumping those hurdles. And then I'll turn to what comes next, our continued focus on money laundering, on procurement networks, and an expanding global effort to address criminal sanctions and export control violations. Last year, at the beginning of March, President Biden announced at the State of the Union that the Department of Justice would be standing up uh, this task force with an emphasis on targeting uh, criminally derived assets of the Russian oligarchs. Within days, the department had established what is now called Task Force Klepto Capture. And we had, at the outset, two lines of, uh, of efforts that we were prioritizing. The first of those was, of course, the rapid seizure of high value assets around the world. Uh, those assets, yachts, planes, cash accounts, securities holdings, um, real estate, constituted illicit proceeds of one sort or another, typically uh, assets involved in money laundering or the proceeds of sanctions evasion or export control evasion. And the primary goal of those seizures uh, was really a, a swift demonstration of the power, the breadth, and the commitment of the United States to what is effectively an economic blockade of the people who provide the Kremlin with material support. Taking immediate action was an effort to spur prosecutors around this country and to spur our global allies to follow suit. And those immediate actions were intended as some unmistakable signals to the private sector that the scope 
and the speed of these investigations was going to require rapid response and an unprecedented, unprecedented level of compliance. I want to give two examples of the early days efforts. The first was the immediate unsealing of charges uh, and the arrest relating to a Kremlin propagandist, Konstantin Malofiev, and his sanctions evasion network. As alleged in the, uh, the Malofiev indictment, uh, he has aided the Russian regime through the provision of funds and propaganda uh, since the original 2014 Crimean invasion. And the case against Malofiev's network, um, it's important to note, predated the creation of this task force. It was a, a project that was actually undertaken um, years prior to the creation of this task force by the Southern District of New York and the money laundering unit there. But while that investigation had existed for some time uh, and had played out over the course of years, our ability, the United States' ability to act on those investigations and act on, on potential charges had been limited. Obtaining evidence abroad, securing extraditions uh, from abroad had been a tall order in a world where the United States' sanctions program is extended significantly beyond that of even our closest allies. But Russia's illegal and violent breach of international law created the conditions for a dramatic shift in that global context. And within days of the announcement of the task force, we had seized bank accounts in the United States. We had secured the arrest of Malofiev's facilitator in the United Kingdom. And this was an example of an immediate public demonstration of that sea change in global cooperation and global realignment. Another example is the high-speed maritime chase of the yacht known as the Amadea. Uh, unlike the Malofiev case, this is one that uh, unfolded in a matter of weeks, not in a matter of years. And I, I want to emphasize that to track a boat fleeing from an international dragnet from the Atlantic through the Panama Canal and quickly across the Pacific was truly a remarkable feat by a, a group of sleepless attorneys agents, analysts, linguists, all dedicated to the task force, and by our global partners around the world. And again, that was an action uh, early on as a demonstration of a, a few key facts. One was our willingness to extend resources, time, and money to take oligarch assets out of commission. And two, that jurisdictions that had historically been viewed as opaque, jurisdictions that had historically been viewed as safe havens, could no longer be relied on by Russia's kleptocrats for the protection of their riches. Throughout the Amadeus failed flight across the Pacific, offshore jurisdictions and purportedly opaque countries chipped in to build that case, did it quickly, uh, and affected our warrant ultimately, ending a half billion dollar uh, yacht being piloted into San Diego Harbor. The demonstrative aspects of those early efforts serve the broader purpose not only of arresting money launderers, but of arresting the attention of international partners and par partners in the private sector. The signals are important uh, to note that everyone in the democratic law-abiding world needed to place th the same sort of importance on upholding the global sanctions regime targeting Russia that the United States had pioneered as early as 2014. And along the way, we began collecting at least some modest recompense for the people of Ukraine, to which I'll return in a moment. For the first goal of the, the task force, of course, the, the goal itself and the means of achieving it are situated in the short term. Um, the assets that we're talking about, apart from physical real estate, are mobile by nature. And our window for executing on those assets uh, would steadily close in the early weeks and, and months of the task force. We do still see today, uh, and we will continue to see, targets for seizure that remain within our grasp. Our investigations continue to uncover illegal sanctions evasion, and our foreign partners continue to strengthen their own criminal sanctions regimes that in turn expand our ability to project American seizures abroad. So we will have opportunities to continue to collect on the debt that uh, the Kremlin's money men owe to the law-abiding world. But the task force has not only been focused on the short term, of course. And the asset seizure blitz that, uh, that I was just describing uh, is not our only or even our most important priority or undertaking. 
From the outset of the task force, we understood that developing robust, internationally focused criminal charges against money laundering and smuggling networks would be, in the long term, our major contribution to reinforcing the U.S. sanctions and export control regime. There are pockets of the global economy, both firms and countries, that have not historically been as committed to instilling adequate and effective money laundering and sanctions compliance programs as one might have hoped. By contrast, for the better part of 25 years, American financial institutions have faced significant penalties, including criminal prosecution, for failures in their anti-money laundering programs. For the better part of 10 years, financial institutions in Western Europe have come to understand that those policies must respect U.S. sanctions and money laundering laws if they want to avoid the same stiff penalties. And if last year's $2 billion criminal forfeiture and guilty plea in the Danske Bank case relating to the activities of its Estonian subsidiary demonstrated nothing else, it provides some tangible and significant evidence that financial institutions with global operations in former Soviet states must invest proactively in rooting out corruption and money laundering through Russia and elsewhere, or face the same massive fines, criminal liability, and incalculable reputational damage. These lessons will be learned in the broader global economy. Businesses that turn a blind eye to illicit procurement networks or novel forms of money laundering through trade-based laundering, through virtual assets, will learn the hard way that their business models come with catastrophic criminal risks. And the way that they will learn that is through charges, seizures, and international arrests. And so from the outset, the task force has poured resources into cases that will drive this point home. And of course, coordinated international investigations and significant, sophisticated uh, charges require some time for both investigation and, and execution. And so as the short-term priorities played out, after approximately six months or so, we began to see the task force rolling out cases that fall into this second priority category. <clears throat> and I'd like to touch on just two examples uh, uh, today. The first is in the field of economic sanctions. In October of last year, we unsealed indictments and conducted arrests in the United States and in the United Kingdom relating to the sanctions evasion network of Oleg Deripaska. He's an aluminum magnate with close ties to the Kremlin. Although we, we did charge Deripaska himself, and we did list uh, three parcels of luxury real estate as forfeitable property in that indictment, I emphasize this case as an example of the department's focus on not the oligarch himself or his assets, but on facilitators for that, uh, for that target the professionals and the service providers who make their money by assisting sanctioned parties in enjoying the privileges of life in a democracy, even as they hustle to undermine those same privileges for others. The second, I want to highlight the export control cases coming out of the Eastern District of New York and the District of Connecticut last year. These cases targeted networks of US, Europe, and Russia-based uh, smugglers and procurement agents smugglers of sensitive and often dangerous technologies. And all told, the prosecutions in those cases resulted in charges against two corporations, roughly a half dozen uh, individuals, including US citizens and including a suspected FSB officer, and the seizure of bank accounts, machine tools, and nearly 400 pounds of sniper rifle ammunition destined to Russia and the Ukrainian front. It's important to emphasize this case uh, while understanding that Russia's military is not autarkic. It's not self-sufficient. It has to go abroad for critical material. It has to go abroad for critical technology. And these cases highlight the commitment of prosecutors in the United States and globally, investigators, linguists, analysts with the task force, and critically our partners in Estonia, in Latvia, in Italy, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, and other countries to imposing serious criminal consequences on anyone whose activities threaten to create a leak in the US and our allies' efforts to strangle the Russian military's ability to continue this ruinous war. So before I talk about what comes next in, in my mind, let me say um, that these cases also highlight a, a key hurdle in our efforts. 
um, and a related opportunity for some new success. The international aspect of this work is both our strength and it's our greatest challenge. Last January, the world was very different with regard to the enforcement of the US's sanctions against the Russian regime. Notwithstanding Russia's record of unlawful arrests and sham prosecutions of uh, journalists, of sham prosecutions of reformers, of international assassinations and assassination attempts, notwithstanding all of those things, executing on US requests for search warrants and subpoenas and interviews and other legal process remained a tall order because there is a mismatch in our US and, and foreign allies' sanctions regimes. But that's no longer the case in theory, and it is dramatically less and less the case in practice. Although the investigative challenges of excavating layer upon layer of multi-jurisdictional fraudulent corporate ownership that, that remains a hallmark of these cases uh, is still a challenge, the alignment and the realignment of international priorities is truly without precedent and continues to make these cases more uh, and more effective. And the cases that I've been discussing are examples, I think, of the power of that alignment, both in the form of seizures of bank accounts, stock holdings, luxury goods, but also in the form of providing information to our foreign partners to ensure the freezing and the confiscation of assets found in other jurisdictions under other jurisdictions' own authorities, and sometimes new authorities, assets that would previously have been untouchable. We expect that that cooperation will only continue to deepen in the future. The European Union's sanctions directives appear to be moving apace to include criminalization of sanctions evasion, a move that upon implementation in the member states will continue to strengthen our ability in the United States to make requests for action abroad and will invite requests from abroad into the United States so that we can take action on behalf of our foreign partners. It will also mean that pressure will continue to mount on those countries through which sanctioned oligarchs and facilitators have historically operated in relative secrecy. And that international, that increased international cooperation is at the top of my mind as we come close to the one year anniversary uh, of these efforts. The task force, along with others throughout the United States government, will continue efforts to advocate for swift implementation of sanctions here and abroad the recognition of criminal penalties for evasion, and for international cooperation with US investigations. Top of mind, too, is our deepening cooperation with those in the private sector, from financial institutions to manufacturers of goods of all kinds and all sizes, in aiding Ukraine uh, by cutting its aggressor off from the lucrative and the legitimate world of international trade and finance. We have, and we will continue to find success in providing information to and receiving information from private firms. I think about this effort essentially as one um, related to traditional organized crime. In organized crime investigations, private businesses and business people tend to be both the vectors for crime and, um, and exploited by it, sometimes simultaneously. And finding support of private business people in that context, sometimes people who fear for their livelihoods, people who, who fear for their physical safety, is critical to success in organized crime prosecutions. But providing a voice for those people who want to fight that exploitation, who, who hate that exploitation and the taint of organized crime in their private business, is a mission that organized crime investigators and prosecutors meet every day, and it's one that we take to heart in the context of this task force as well. There are millions of people in the United States who drive the wheels of commerce and deliver the seeds of capital who want to contribute to a safe, just, prosperous, and law-abiding world. They want and they deserve to feel pride in their professions and in their firms, their teams. And the task force has been, and it remains here to partner with them, to empower and to provide an opportunity to act on that pride. And I need the private sector, frankly, if this task force is going to continue to be successful uh, tomorrow and in the long run. To that end, success, in my mind, goes beyond seizures and it goes beyond prosecution. It goes beyond arrest. Success may well lie in providing information sufficient to allow private firms 
to take their own actions in service of fighting Russian aggression. Abrupt calls on loans, revocation of insurance com coverage that essentially moors a, a, a vessel, for example, the firing of clients whose adherence to the Russian regime makes them financially and ethically untenable, all of that counts as success uh, in, in my mind. In the future, we're also poised to begin the transfer of forfeited assets for the benefit of Ukraine. I want to highlight this as a, as a relatively recent development. Um, in the closing days of 2022, Congress passed uh, and the President signs the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. And among its provisions is a law that newly empowers the Justice Department to direct forfeited funds uh, to uh, the State Department for the purpose of providing aid to Ukraine. The law doesn't provide a route for the transfer of all forfeited funds that might arise through these efforts. And importantly, forfeitures tied to export control violations are not currently included in that new provision. It's not a silver bullet, but it is nevertheless uh, something that makes me hopeful that we will start to see the first transfers from justice to the State Department occurring in the coming weeks and months uh, as the first final orders of forfeiture are obtained with respect to certain assets. To be clear, these amounts are minuscule compared to the cost of the catastrophe inflicted by Russia on the people and the land of Ukraine. But the contribution is important. It's important first because any forfeited dollar uh, available to address what Mr. Greenduck called the civilizational assault is a dollar put to good use. And it's also important as a model for our foreign partners who we continue to be in dialogue with about this issue. It is possible to adhere to established law. It is possible to target criminal proceeds through rule-based forfeiture. It's possible to give innocent third parties an opportunity to contest those forfeiture and to be heard with respect to our seizures. It's possible and it is permissible under fundamental norms of due process and international law to divest criminal actors of ill-gotten gains and to make those assets available to the victims of this illegal war. It is possible, it is imperative, and we're doing it in the United States. It may be a challenge, and it may require new laws. It may require new methods of investigation and prosecution. But this is a challenge worth meeting. And it's a challenge that we hear uh, in the US, at the DOJ, at Treasury, at State, in Congress, have met and will meet again. These upcoming transfers are proof for the world uh, that at the task force, we can be successful when we act on facts and under the strictures and limitations of the law in stark distinction with our adversaries. Fundamentally important to this project, in my mind, is that we embrace the challenges. We embrace the, uh, the, the investigatory, the prosecutorial, and the litigation challenges that are inherent in this effort so that those looking to the United States can see this task force and see this aid to Ukraine as an exercise in demonstrating the power of the rule of law and the power of that rule when amplified through dedicated public servants, committed private sectors, empowered private sector, and an unprecedented level of international cooperation. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that uh, very detailed and clear overview of all the work you've been doing uh, in the past, well, coming up to a year. Um, I was delighted you, you brought up the Grinder event, which I wasn't aware you'd seen. Uh, and actually, to add a, a very quick anecdote of my own, one of my first jobs at Hudson Institute was uh, standing at the back of that event, uh, helping to make sure everything ran smoothly, uh, including the translation for Mr. Grinder, who didn't speak English, uh, which was, we hadn't done before. So that was, that was tricky. But now we're both up here uh, together, I guess. So. Uh, you know, things come around. <laughs> um, I wanted to start off by asking you uh, a, a question that sort of jumps to the front of every, a lay people at least mind. Um, and I'm going I'm to ask you so, because I think journalists will anyway if they don't. But um, is it possible to put a, a figure uh, on the total value of assets that have been sort of uh, frozen and seized by, by the klepto capture unit uh, si since March last year? And secondly, is it, is it possible to, to talk a bit more about how much money, uh, or what proportion of that is likely to be returned to Ukraine in the coming weeks and months? And any more information you can give us about, about that upcoming transfer of assets under the new law? Sure. So uh, on the, the value question first and then the, the process second. On the value, 
um, it's not an exact science, but what we have seized, and, and I want to distinguish between what we have either gotten a warrant for or listed in, a, in an indictment as forfeitable, um, as opposed to things that are blocked or frozen by Treasury, which is a, a much larger and, yep. frankly, harder to calculate number. <laughs> Um, but what is essentially subject to our forfeiture uh, actions is you know, in the, the hundreds of millions, if not over a billion, um, we're talking about the fair market value of super yachts and, yeah. uh, and luxury villas, et cetera. So it's not an exact number, mm -hmm. um, but, but it's substantial. The, um, what's available for transfer? Uh, I expect that we will be able to get anything that we forfeited to Ukraine for purposes of, of mm -hmm. reconstruction and, and, and aid. The process um, was greatly eased by um, the, the amendment to the, the law at the end of the year last year with respect to um, assets that are related to certain sanctions violations. It, it happens that many of the cases that we have today relate to that particular sanctions violation or that suite of sanctions violations that allow for the, this streamlined provision of funds to the State Department. It doesn't, um, that law doesn't, doesn't provide the same streamlining for things like export control violations and things that are seized under that authority or related to that authority. <laughs> it doesn't relate to funds that um, are involved in, in acts that are in violation of slightly earlier executive orders. So there, there are some subset of assets where we may need to um, uh, go through a, a different route to, to make the funds available. And that's fine, because the underlying principle of collective capture's work isn't, you know, the bulk of U.S. assistance to Ukraine is coming from DOD and the State Department. You know, that's the tens of hundreds of billions or whatever it is, you know, we're going to end up spending. Um, you know, this is more about de delivering some measure of accountability and, show, and showing that justice will be done, right? Uh, I, I against, think that's uh, right. Yeah, I mean, that's the guiding sort of principle here, um, which is, has huge value beyond numbers in itself, which is why I sort of said other people will ask, I'm actually not massively interested, strangely, in how much money you've seized, <laughs> just more that you're actually doing it, which I think is great. Uh, and then secondly, uh, yesterday um, there was a huge enforcement action against uh, a crypto exchange, uh, Blitzlato, which I hadn't heard of before, but apparently is doing, it's China-based uh, Russian founder uh, with massive uh, sort of sanctions, money laundering uh, facilitator. And it got me thinking, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that the Treasury used there was an updated authority they had because they hadn't been able to, um, they, they sort of imposed a sort of a kind of sanction on, on, this, on this crypto exchange. But they wouldn't, have been able to, it wouldn't be able to do it sort of previously without an update to that, to that law um, that they used to do it, the authority. Um, because cri crypto is one of those new areas where, um, you know, anti-money laundering provisions that were passed, like, you know, in, in the, during the war on terror were designed for old-fashioned banking where, Banks had correspondent accounts and, you know, sort of gentlemen bankers arranged for money transfers and things, whereas nowadays, you know, with money service businesses, everything's online, people are just doing it themselves. Um, are you finding as, um, you know, we all, we all, I think most people, at least in this room, are probably familiar with the traditional model of Russian kleptocracy. They, they embezzle whatever the, or whatever it is, they steal, uh, you know, whatever it is back in Russia, then they set up, you know, shell companies, they use banks and, you know, offshore tax havens to launder money into the West, into real estate and so on. But as, as the, um, the US leads the Western crackdown uh, on this model of, of Russian kleptocracy, are you finding that um, the, the Russian kleptocrats themselves are, are adopting these alternative, uh, moving more into these alternative um, sort of more updated versions of money laundering? Are they using crypto more, for example? Um, so there, I think we do see shifts in, in certain kinds of typology. I'll, I'll touch on crypto in just a second. But the main shift is, is geographic. Um, I mean, you, you can see um, you can see yachts and planes on Twitter bots uh, <laughs> off to, to particular jurisdictions. It's no um, accident that things are are sort of congealing in particular jurisdictions where it's less likely that uh, we'll get traction on a, a seizure warrant, for example. Um, so that's one one shift in terms of corporate structuring. I, I think we we have seen and maybe we've seen an uptick in um, essentially the use of private trusts and and you know sham divestments mm -hmm. um, through through the use of trust vehicles. That's not necessarily new, um, yeah. but there's certainly an incentive to to use it more often than by a broader swath of people today. Mm -hmm. um, 
On the, the crypto side, I think is really is particularly interesting, and I'll bring it back to the emphasis um, on uh, actually on export controls, um, which I think may not be at the, the top of mind when people think mm -hmm. about uh, the crypto side. The, there are technological um, and sort of economic limitations that make me think uh, that you're unlikely to see an oligarch park a billion dollars of their assets into you know FTT, for example, mm -hmm. um, especially today. Um, but uh, and so for, from that from that perspective, as a money laundering tool for parking a huge amount of money and hoping that it stays stable and safe and anonymous over the long term, crypto may have some utility. It's not the most obvious thing as compared to, say, real estate held by uh, a series of, of nested trusts. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, with respect to export control in particular, crypto is a, is a very good way of conducting a relatively anonymous or pseudonymous cross-border payments um, for goods and services. And, um, and we look very heavily at, at, um, at the crypto space in that milieu. And you see some, at least some public reporting from firms that, uh, that do uh, coin tracing and, and the like uh, of payments to things like Russian military and paramilitary mm -hmm. military groups. So that's um, certainly at the top of mind, but we think of it not so much as an oligarch problem probably, um, more as a, a payments problem. I think that's a really important point to highlight about your work is that everyone associates you with oligarchs, but actually you're charged with going after any sort of Russian sanctions Beijing, right? That's um, right. Could yeah. you talk a bit more, how much of your work is going after sort of big flashy oligarchs yachts and then proportionally like, you know, going after kind of the, like you said, you, you seized all this sniper ammunition. Um, presumably that sort of thing is probably more of a priority at this point than, than not the oligarchs. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, I'd, like um, we, we or I discussed earlier, um, we started with two essentially parallel priorities. The early days efforts are these, these quick seizures of mobile assets, and that'll continue, continue apace to a degree. Um, but if you'd asked me that question in March of last year, or April of last year, 120% was focused on, um, on the seizure of, of mobile, quickly moving oligarch mm -hmm. assets while we were beginning these longer term criminal investigations that started to come to fruition in October, roughly, of, uh, of last year. At this point, I, I continue to see some targets of opportunity on the, the oligarch side. We, mm -hmm. I think we will continue to see that. Proportionally, the longer term priority is becoming, I think, uh, more of sort of the, the predominant um, flavor of the task force work. So before, I'm going to take some questions from the audience in a minute, because I know they're probably brimming with questions for you. But because we're a policy shop here at Hudson, we've, we've tried to talk about, sort of, if not solutions, then what can advance and make your work more effective. Are there sort of additional legal authorities or resources, you know, like a database full of certain kind of data you don't have at the moment, but you're sitting at your desk and you think, oh, if only I could do this to that, this person or I, could, or I could get access to this information, this case would be over tomorrow. Is, is, there, is there major things that sort of get in your way that you would, lo you would love to see Congress or the administration act on to, to make your life easier? Well, I, it'll, certainly over the next year or so, I think it'll be interesting to see how um, impactful beneficial ownership registrations uh, are. They certainly have been useful um, when that information is available through foreign partners who have, who have analogous um, registries. Um, and you know, we worked with, um, through our Office of Legal Affairs last year, we worked closely with, uh, with folks on the Hill on a number of proposals. Um, I, I think critically the asset transfer uh, portion did pass, at, at least in a, a significant way. And that, in my mind, is, is kind of the whole point. Um, yeah. So I, I do, uh, I, I think that that was a, a huge success on the Hill. I think it was a huge success at, at DOJ. Um, we had some proposals for expanding a, um, forfeiture authority and expanding um, criminal liability with respect to, again, export controls and, and IEPA, including it in um, among the, the predicate acts for racketeering, for example, yeah. um, uh, that we talked about. So a handful of, uh, of, of proposals that didn't make it in last year that I'm sure we'll continue to have conversations about. I should say lots of those, lots of those um you know, uh, measures that you, that you mentioned, you know, I, I was involved in talking to people on the Hill. I know we have Congress, former Congressman Malinowski's uh, star, Phil McDaniel, who worked on these, many of these things as well. 
Uh, I, th I don't think those things are, are dead in the water by any means. You know, they're, they're clearly, there's clearly a pressing need for them. I hope they come back again uh, this year, and I'll be doing everything I can from Hudson to, to help that happen uh, in my own little way. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, I, I've been abusing my moderator privilege, but I wonder if anyone in the audience has any uh, sort of pressing questions. Ilya, hand up, hand up like a rocket there. Is, uh, if you could, oh, yeah, sorry. If you could just introduce yourself and your affiliation, just so... Andrew knows so who's talking uh, to you. Ilya I'm, uh, I work at uh, SAIP, but uh, I'm also an activist researcher on Russian oligarchs for over a decade. And it's, uh, thank you very much for a great presentation. And it's heartwarming to hear about a uh, presentation uh, by Green de Gonzalez, where I was also there. Uh, and obviously, he predicted uh, national security implications from coming from oligarchs in Russia a long time ago. I have two questions for you. Uh, so firstly, um, Following sanctions very closely for a long time, even before Ukraine events, uh, but even with Ukraine events, I noticed that s for some reason, U.S. seems to be falling behind on sanctioning individual oligarchs compared to, say, U.K. and E.U., and I wonder wh why is that happening and if you have any... It seems like U.S. is more f focusing on financial institutions proportionately compared to, say, E.U. and U.K. And... Uh, Second question, um, recently there were media reports uh, suggesting that um, some oligarchs like Abramovich uh, probably knew uh, about the coming war, and that's why they started moving assets uh, weeks and days before the, before the war. Have you noticed anything like that in your work? Uh, do, do you have any comment on how uh, knowledgeable um, uh, you know, these oligarchs are about Putin's actions? I personally believe, I don't have proof, but I, from everything I know about I guess I think they are very close and they remain. Uh, uh, so it all really brings to this uh, broader question of how, how you define proximity of oligarchs. So I wonder also if you have any comment on that broader question. Thank you. Sure. And I think the, the end of the second question always loops back to the first. So in terms of prioritization for um, you know, who goes on the list, whether it's an entity, an oligarch, family members, et cetera, um, there are subtler minds at work at Treasury than at DOJ, and so I largely defer, uh, largely defer there. The work of thinking about the economic implications, um, the political implications, um, both negative and positive, um, it really lies within the, the the expertise and the purview of folks at, at Treasury, State, Commerce Department uh, uh, over there. And our work at, at Justice is really plugging holes in the system that is, is created. So you're right that there, it's not perfect alignment um, or, or an exact match of the list between the US and the EU or the US and, and the UK. It is um, hard to understate the significantly greater alignment that exists now as compared to January of last year. Um, and then on, on the second question, um, uh, I'll take it as kind of a, um, a legal question about anticipation of, of sanctions violations. And the, the fact is, absent a different kind of crime, anticipating that a person might be sanctioned and dissipating assets is not a crime um, uh, as it stands today. And so that doesn't mean we don't take a look at um, you know, shady financial transactions that might might be motivated by exactly that sort of thing. If you're lying to a bank in order to move money quickly uh, in a way that is designed to you know evade their their AML policies, for example, you may have exposure in in different ways that don't implicate a sanctions charge. Um, it's not the end of the story, but it's it is certainly the case that um, you can't violate a sanction that doesn't exist yet. I wanted to, uh, just to follow up on Ilya's question, this, um, when you talk about working with international partners on these things and aligning, um, this is the, this is the uh, what, uh, I always forget, the repo task force, uh, Russian elites, proxies, and oligarchs task force, right? Um, that is, uh, as I understand it, an operational thing between law enforcement agencies like yours. Is there a policy element to that as well, though? Does, is Treasury is part of that. Are they talking about, is that also the, the vehicle through which sanctions are, they trying to align their sanctions regimes, uh, in addition to you lawyers sort of talking to each other about enforcing them? Um, I would actually uh, flip the, the view. So I think REPO, uh, which is an international mm -hmm. task force, and DOJ and Treasury sit on, uh, on REPO, 
um, is is largely a sort of policy alignment and okay. um, and exchange of typology information sort of mm -hmm. sort of platform. Um, it's not the action arm specifically. Oh, okay. The ta uh, the klepto capture, I at least in the United States, is where where the criminal charges are going to be worked out. Mm -hmm. And when we need to work uh, work abroad, we'll do it with Eurojust. We'll do it with uh, bilaterally, for example, with um, partners in the UK, with mm -hmm. partners in Spain, et, et, et cetera. OK. Um, any other questions? Amy? Uh, Amy McKinnon, I'm a national security reporter with Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak about the export control component. Um, I assume if there are ongoing investigations, there's not a lot you can say, but can you give us a flavor of, is this still going on? Are there still entities which are funneling components or weapons to the Russian military? And do you expect there's going to be future indictments on the export control front? Um, so. Without getting into specifics, obviously the answer is yes. Um, the, it's a major component of what we're looking at right now. Um, and in my mind, maybe the most important component um, uh, it, because it has such an obvious material impact on, on, you know, on lives in Ukraine. So um, it, it's something that we've looked at heavily for the, the, the duration with an emphasis on military technology, dual use technology, um, uh, material that really makes the Russian military work and keeps the, keeps the, the tanks rolling. And so it, it will remain a, a serious priority. We look at things like upticks in, um, uh, in transshipment of, of sensitive technology through Russia adjacent uh, jurisdictions and countries. Um, the Commerce Department uh, and their enforcement team and their investigators have been phenomenal partners uh, in this. They, they are, um, uh, along with Treasury, along with State, along with the, the DOJ, the integral partner in, in, um, in targeting that particular problem set. And we work extremely closely with them um, essentially every day. Okay. Trevor? Trevor Sutton, Center for American Progress. Uh, I'm wondering if you could describe a little bit more the, the structure of the task force and sort of what um, resources and I, I suppose facilitation it's sort of unlocked um, and you know, how it's made some of these prosecutions and investigations I think more possible. Um, and I had another question. You mentioned the private sector. Uh, I, I'm curious to what extent you've seen a kind of uh, institutional change in culture since the creation of the task force or since the invasion. Um, I'm sure you're aware uh, in 2021 there was a big expose published by ICIJ about sort of uh, um, uh, relating to the leak of FinCEN files that I think reflected a sort of endemic um, tolerance for high risk clients on the part of financial institutions uh, and even an expectation of regulatory breaches kind of on the theory that uh, the value of those clients uh, exceeded whatever penalties would be imposed. Um, and I'm curious, I understand of course that much of that regulatory regime is overseen by Treasury, but I'm wondering if you've seen different attitude in the part of uh, financial institutions and other facilitators in terms of like voluntary disclosures or the sort of thoroughness of their uh, AML and due diligence programs. Okay, um, great question. So the, on, the, um, on the structural point first, uh, and then on the, onto the private sector. So structurally, the, the task force looks as, as follows. We sit in the Deputy Attorney General's office within DOJ. That has a, a particularly beneficial effect insofar as it, it sits on top, on the flow chart, it sits on top of national security on the one hand and the criminal division on the other. And it, as a result, has the ability to draw on expertise um, and, uh, and, and attorneys and, um, uh, uh, and approval chains from both the, on the one hand, counterproliferation and export control section, uh, and the money laundering and asset recovery section, forfeiture and money laundering experts, um, and really house it all in one, one piece. So bureaucratically, that's the, the structure. Um, uh, we benefited from some appropriations early last year, or sort of in the, the spring and summer of last year. So the, uh, that's the, the funding structure there. 
Um, and then the last component that I mentioned is um, cooperation with the U.S. attorneys community. So um, I come from the Southern District of New York. I still sit in the Southern District of, of New York, um, and, and most of my time is spent, spent there. That office, the Eastern District of New York, the District of the District of Columbia, Southern Florida, Central California, a, a number of Connecticut, a number of other U.S. attorney's offices have been integral to the work there. And the idea has not been to steal cases or supplant cases. It's to identify which cases are strategically uh, to be prioritized and throw resources at, at those cases and to, as, as much as possible, streamline their ability to get what they need um, through channels at, at Maine Justice. So that's the structure. Um, on the, the private side piece, um, there, it's a, you know, it's a bit anecdotal from my perspective, but I would say there's, I, I have experienced an uptick in uh, folks from foreign financial institutions calling. Um, it is the, the case that US financial institutions are, are fairly deeply in dialogue with DOJ, with FinCEN, and others on a, on a pretty regular basis. Um, uh, so I wouldn't describe that as a, any sort of sea change in that respect, but I do see uh, an uptick in, um, in foreign dialogue. Um, and of course, there are voluntary self-disclosure policies, including a voluntary self-disclosure policy with the, the National Security Division um, that, that exists for people to come in and get some real benefit if they, if they move early. Um, it, so it, it's there for that purpose. And it's there, I think, um, to be trumpeted to parts of the economy that are sort of less in dialogue with, the, with DOJ. That, again, goes back to export controls. Um, I, I point out there's a, a pretty significant difference between a financial institution which has BSA, a Bank Secrecy Act obligations, a, affirmative obligations to maintain these adequate controls and adequate anti-money laundering policies, and to be swiftly in contact with FinCEN if they see a problem, file a, a SAR, a suspicious activity report, for example. And, um, uh, and manufacturers who may be in the export control world that are not financial institutions that might not have that affirmative obligation to engage in, in that way. That's not to say that they don't. Um, and again, the Commerce Department has, a, um, I think, a, an impressive track record of working with the private sector, um, both to instill a sense of compliance and to um, exploit that sense of compliance to develop these cases. Um, but I would say that this, this effort has only been an opportunity to drive that point home. I'm uh, Phil, the former Congressman Malinowski who led the congressional effort to get this transfer authority through. I guess w we hoped that, you know, the passage of the authority would incentivize building these forfeiture cases. I guess, can you just explain to us, though, in layman's terms, what, is it, what does it take to take a case from all these frozen cases to how much legwork does it really take for you guys and manpower to move it to a forfeited, into your forfeited bucket? And what would it take, what do you need from Congress, what do you need from, you know, the interagency to push more, right? Like, with more bodies, with more money, could you push more from one bucket to the other? And like, what does that, what does that look like? Thank you. So, um, it, it takes more bodies and it takes more money and it takes more resources to move things faster. The, there are, um, there are people who are dedicated, people being trial attorneys at Maine Justice, there are U.S. attorney's offices and, and assistant U.S. attorneys who are devoted to these cases, and, um, uh, and there are more cases than, than there are people to work them, for sure. Um, it takes a lot of, uh, of resources to get a sufficient number of Russian linguists, to get a sufficient number of, uh, of uh, bank records poured through, or cryptocurrency accounts analyzed through, through blockchain analysis. Like, all of that takes money, uh, and all of it takes time uh, and people. So. It, fundamentally, it is that kind of resource that, that gets these things to the finish line faster. Um, I think that uh, the, the transfer authority, 
doesn't change anything about what is seizable or what is forfeitable. It only, uh, only changes what we can do with funds that are ultimately forfeited. And uh, my sense is that, that um, had that not passed at all, there would be deep incentive to continue the, the, the work at the pace that it, that it works. The excellent thing about that, uh, that piece of legislation is that it, it greatly streamlines the, the ultimate goal that I think existed before it, before it passed anyway, um, to get money where it should go um, in a way that doesn't require the Justice Department to essentially um, enter into a series of, of uh, international agreements to share funds through a totally different mechanism that is relatively cumbersome compared to um, what the congressman and his colleagues were able to get through. Uh, all credit to those uh, members of Congress who did see the potential of the, the work that you were doing and the importance of it and, and did so much hard work, including your boss's office uh, for last year. Um, when you talk about the, just a very quick aside, which is a bit boring and technical, but when you talk about the delays in, in um, you know, getting more people in with the right expertise, the Russian linguists, the, and so on and so forth, how much of that is due to the backlog in, in like clear, getting security clearances? Is that, is that a big part of your work? Is that a big problem? Is that in your way? or? Um, on the on the margin, it can be with a particular AUSA or a particular trial attorney. Um, it's certainly not the. Not the I wouldn't describe yeah. it as any, anything like a predominant problem. I always ask because it seems to clog the wheels of every, everything good that anyone's trying to do in, in uh, Washington. <laughs> so um, I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned earlier that you're seeing new. Um, when I asked you about new new methods, you said you're seeing new ju new jurisdictions come into play. Um, as centers for, for sanctions, evasion, and money laundering. I mean, the ones that have hit the headlines are the United Arab Emirates and Turkey as two particular places where um, oligarchs, at least, are parking their money. And, and Turkey, I know, has had a lot of strange um, boost in, in financial flows, which it can't account for. Um, what are the sort of additional... I'm, I'm sort of thinking back to sort of the war on terror when tr Treasury took the kind of anti-money laundering um, reform agenda sort of overseas. And they encountered the same sort of problem is that people, you know, it's one thing to go in and have, have an argument with, uh, you know, people in one of the small traditional tax havens who aren't really sort of a global strategic, uh, you know, important partner for the US perhaps. But then when we're talking about countries like Turkey, a NATO ally, we're talking about the UAE, a, a strong partner in like counterterrorism stuff, as well as our financial ties. Do you, as a, as a, as a, as a lawyer, as a, as, a, as a DOJ prosecutor, um, how do you sort of navigate the additional political difficulties of, of sort of dealing with those countries that maybe they're on our side nominally, but they're actually not very cooperative and it's not always clear what side they're actually on in any given issue? There are pockets of cooperation everywhere in the world, um, has been my, my experience. Um, and DOJ works productively even with countries that are um, uh, not considered to be the most aligned country mm -hmm. um, in, in any given situation. And, um, and I would say that the Amadea example is, is one such example uh, where information was coming from jurisdictions that I think were viewed as relatively opaque or relatively mm -hmm. um, you know, oligarch friendly perhaps. Yeah. Um, and still, uh, given I think the, the the moral imperative of this particular situation it has been possible to operate even in uh, in sort of the darkest corners of the, the financial world. The uh, the other point that I just um, would quickly make on uh, to to leap off of one aspect of that question, I think it's been a learning experience or or sort of a a public um, uh, a public example from these cases that. Jurisdictions that might not be viewed as the most strategically important are invaluable <laughs> in these cases, um, and uh, and really, the tiniest island on the farthest flung ocean mm. uh, can be a make or break on significant matters. It's it's important to to maintain the relationships. Any last questions? We're coming up to um, end of our time. Yep. I don't have my glasses on. Is that France? Is that the yeah. right way? It is. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm Francis, uh, Francis Shin from the Atlantic Council. And a quick question on repo. Uh, so it's composed of G7 and Australia. Uh, do you expect repo's uh, uh, jurisdictions to grow with, uh, with more partners? Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of current 
conversations to, to grow repo, I, I would say that most of the conversations have been about deepening the, the partnership and really mining the, 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 the resources that exist today. And then the resources that exist in terms of developing information, developing channels of communication and, uh, and um, uh, channels of cooperation are available for partners outside of, of repo. We, we have certainly seen folks who are not part of the, the repo task force take advantage of the fruits of the repo task force and continue to push that every day. Come sort of the end of our time now, so I just wanted to have a final thought from you on what, um, what does what does, what does success look like for in the, in the longer term? What's the is there a point at which you you sort of, you close your book on the desk and you, you call Lisa Monaco and you say we've we finished, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or is this just going to be an ongoing thing for the rest of our lives? Uh, you know, what what does what, what does success look like for you and what are your your hopes for the for, for, for klepto capture going forward I, I would uh, be in in significant trouble and danger if I had called Lisa Monaco and said we're finished <laughs> um, so that's not going to happen I think that um, I, I think the department is only going to deepen its commitment on on looking at this problem set and, and continuing to put resources and expertise in, into it and I think that in the long run um, for that to to happen will count as mm -hmm. as success. On the outside of the DOJ, um, I really think that this opportunity, in the same way that the department's engagement on Bank Secrecy Act cases and on AML cases, on um, money laundering cases in the crypto space over the last few years, has had this sort of significant impact on the private sector mm -hmm. and empowering people in the private sector to stand up and say, we don't want our firms and our teams to be conduits for this kind of kleptocratic exploitation. Um, to empower people in, in that way will be a long-term success. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I've learned so much today. I thought I was one of the experts on this stuff, but I've learned so much. <laughs> uh, and one of the most important things I've learned is, is the expanding and changing nature of your work. You know, everyone saw the headlines, you know, back last year about you seizing yachts and things like that. But I think the, the, the underlying and important, and, you know, delivering, uh, you know, Public recognition, the accountability to, to Putin's kleptocratic, uh, you know, cronies, uh, is is and you know, where possible, justice. Although account some measure of accountability is more likely than the full justice they deserve to face in many cases. That's so important in and of itself. Uh, but this work you're doing on, on the broader uh, sanctions evasion and export controls uh, sounds like it is something that, it, as you say, is just going to keep going and get getting more important. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Firstly. Um, it's great. So I'd love that you started with the Grinder uh, anecdote and we we'll, we'll circle back to that. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for all the amazing work you're doing um, to deprive uh, the Kremlin of its ill-gotten gains. Uh, keep it up. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> to the to the institute. Thank you for uh, for joining today and for the questions. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Be well. Thanks.